everybody. Uh, and thank you all for coming this beautiful evening now that uh, spring has finally arrived. And uh, I'm Peter Kern, director of the Global Public Health Program. Uh, it's my um, pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker for tonight um, and uh, to welcome all of you here. So this uh, lecture series is co-sponsored by the uh, Global Public Health Program and the Institute for Health and Humanities. And we also are very privileged to have the Missoula Community Access Television uh, grant to be able to videotape the uh, presentations in this lecture series, which are then posted on the Global Public Health website. So I was just looking at that today. And that's live. You can go back to 2012, is it? I think it's 2013, 14, maybe something like 2014, at least 2014. And uh, catch up on all the lectures you might have missed. Uh, and there's some really good ones there, believe me. <clears throat> Tonight's is going to be one of those really good ones, I am sure. So um, I'd like to introduce uh, my longtime friend and colleague, uh, Chris Ziegler. Uh, I think, you know, first of all, I'd like to say he's one of the most um, uh, attentive and uh, diligent members of the External Advisory Committee for the Global Public Health Program that sponsors this lecture series. So it's great to always welcome somebody from our own group to give a lecture in this, in this series. Um, Chris has uh, a remarkable career. Uh, he started out in the Peace Corps um, in Sierra Leone with his wife Jeannie and they did some wonderful work there and that's kind of connected to what I think he might talk about tonight. Uh, then he uh, did his uh, master's degree in public administration. He worked at uh, uh, St. Pat's for many years in a health capacity, worked as a health consultant. Um, and now he's got some really exciting projects going on uh, back in Sierra Leone and I think it's India as well, is that right? And Kenya. Um, so uh, you've got, uh, you know, and I, as I mentioned last week, I teach a course on international development. <clears throat> uh, I'll be teaching that course in the fall. So I want to know what the secret ingredient is. And so we're going to find that out tonight. So with that, please join me in welcoming Chris Ziegler for tonight's lecture. So I want you to know first that Peter had to wing that since he forgot the actual bio. So, so he did a pretty good job. Please fill in anything I forgot, all right? So. I feel like I'm in a hospital getting plugged in here. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Peter said, uh, I was in the Peace Corps in 1967 to 69 in Sierra Leone, and with little training and no experience, I didn't know how to go about development at all. So it's only been in the last 15 years that I've begun to understand what it's all about. But I did have a, a great time in the Peace Corps, and I recommend it, highly recommend it to any of you who might be thinking about it. Uh, and just to try and, oops, give you a sense of it, we're going to get started with a little music. And I can't translate it for you either. Okay, so that was, that was a, a women's group, one of the projects that I'll talk about tonight, just greeting us as we came into the village. Um, women loved to sing. Um, they also loved the fact that we were there to support them in their activities. Um, but so again, it's been in the last 15 years, well, let's talk about 
Peace Corps here first. Um, I was a community development worker, and our primary job was to introduce improved varieties of seed rice and different techniques, slightly different techniques for swamp rice cultivation of that um, of the rice. Um, and so I was, I mean, that was my first job in the Peace Corps, and I was exceptional. I sold every bag of rice that the Peace Corps could get me. And then when it came time for the planting, people came up to me and said, we're so glad you had that rice, because we were entering the hungry season, and we needed some rice to eat, and this way we could save our rice to keep planting the same rice we had forever and ever and ever. So there went the, uh, the improved seed varieties. Over on the right, this guy, uh, we would call him today, he was my fixer. The paramount chief in the first village I was in um, just talked to Jai and said, don't let this guy get into any trouble, don't let him get hurt, make sure he has a good time. So I'd been in the, I'd been in the village about six weeks and there was a coup in the country. So Panjai said, go over into your house, and this was my house at the time, uh, go over into your house, lock the door, and I'll come get you when things are okay. So I sat in that house, and so this is West Africa. It's about 95 degrees with 95% humidity. I'm inside my house, sitting next to my kerosene lantern, listening to military music on the radio. Now, if you, if you think about military music and you think about a coup, it sounds like a funeral dirge. So I was writing this letter home wondering whether it was the last letter I was ever going to write back to the States. Turned out the next day when the lorries came from Freetown, which is the capital city, that one of the coup leaders was from our village. So everything was going to be fine, not a problem. As I said, um, this was my house back in 1967, and this picture was taken a year ago, so it's still standing. And this gentleman here is also seen over here, and he, if you'll excuse the term, he was my houseboy, that was the British term. So he used to wash my clothes, cook my meals, and he, <laughs> he really was proud of his cooking because he had learned from the English how to cook, and if you've ever had English food, it's not all that good. Um, but we got together, that was the first time I'd seen him in 50 years, 52 years, um, when I went back last year. And I'd seen Pa and Jai and stayed in touch with him over the last um, eight or nine years. Um, and one of my favorite pictures over here is just people have, they, they are born with and then um, learn a wonderful sense of balance. So they're carrying just uh, green leaves, kind of a, you know, not a heavy load, but one that you would have trouble balancing if you didn't practice a lot because it can move around and you're walking over rocky surfaces or through the bush. Uh, incredible balance. I couldn't get um, the picture of the girl in Freetown with seven layers of eggs on top of her head walking down the street. It was just a little too blurry, so we didn't do that one. Uh, again, Peace Corps was great. Lifelong friendships with Sierra Leoneans and with other Peace Corps volunteers. But so it comes to the last 15 years, and, and what I've come to understand is that um, change comes from within. It's not something you can hand off. It's not something you can hand over. It's not something that you can impose if you think you have a good idea and the right plan. It must come from within. The development landscape is littered with uh, empty classrooms, um, computer labs without electricity, uh, water wells that are covered in weeds, not usable anymore. So, don't want to keep you in suspense anymore. What's the answer? Empowerment. Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen says, a focus on understanding and promoting conditions that allow people to participate in fully shaping their own futures is the key to development. Another way to look at it is 
change is hard. So if I'm coming to you and saying, why don't you make this change? And you know that I'm only going to be there for a short while. Why would you bother to get invested in that change? If it's something that, if I'm asking you to change farming practices that you've used for millennia, well, I can outweigh this guy. If he's, he's going to leave in a little while, I don't have to worry about it. So change is hard, and you have to remember that. I have to understand that. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Paul Farmer, who has an incredible NGO called Partners in Health, uh, has another term for it. He calls it accompaniment. And that means simply walking with the people that you're trying to help. Not getting out ahead of them, not telling them what they need to do, but walking with them. And he says that's the game changer in the how of development. Tonight I'm going to describe the efforts of three different organizations in Sierra Leone. Um, they approach empowerment and accompany most in slightly different ways, but very similar. But I hope to convince you that the principal role of the international development worker is to empower others to create the change that's needed. So the three organizations are Village Hope Incorporated, the YMCA of Sierra Leone, and Right Sharing. Each of these organizations, again, uses accompaniment and empowerment in slightly different ways, as you'll see. And if you have questions along the way, please interrupt me at any time. Sierra Leone is on the west coast of Africa. Whoops. Wrong one. Right. Over there, if you turn on the light. If you point it right in your eyes, it'll go on. <laughs> <laughs> if you, obviously, probably if you push the right button, it'll go on. There we are. It's right over there. There's Conakry and Sierra Leone's right below it. So Guinea is, it borders Guinea on the north and the east, and then Liberia on the south. You might recognize those from the Ebola epidemic. Um, some statistics, and, and for those of you that are actually in health, um, the global burden of disease. If you Google health, um, healthdata.org, it's a wonderful resource for looking at statistics in any country. What are the leading causes of death? And more importantly, what are the le leading causes of disability, which then can relate to death later, but decrease productivity, decrease quality of life for people. And the, statistic, the, the data is so fine that in the United States, we, you could look at Missoula County and compare it to Butte Silver Bow, or you could compare it to uh, New York City. I mean, it's, in, it's an incredible wealth of data. It's funded by the, now, by the Gates Foundation. What's the name of that source again? Healthdata.org. It's a global burden of disease. So most of these statistics come from that. Sierra Leone ranks 184 out of 188, 184th out of 188 countries on the Human Development Index, and that's education, um, mortality rates, child and infant mortality, things like that. Life expectancy is now 60.5 years compared to 40 in 1998, which was in the middle of a civil war per capita of about $1,400 a year, but more importantly, over half of the people in the country live on less than $2 a day. Population of 7.8 million, two-thirds of which are subsistence farmers. And rough definition of subsistence farming means that you don't have money to send your kids to school, even if it's free childhood ed or primary school education, because you can't pay for the uniforms, you can't pay for the books. Secondly, um, you need to keep those kids at home so that they can work in the fields so that they can feed the family. And you certainly don't have enough money to pay for um, a doctor or a nurse, which leads to about 120 some Sierra Leonean physicians in the country or one for every 62,000 in population. That compares to one for every 1,500 or 2,000 in the United States. Many of those will go away to school to the UK or the United States. They get a good uh, physician medical degree. And they say, how can I go back to Sierra Leone when there's one 
um, CAT scanner in the country, or there's no treatment for oncology, things like that. And so they end up staying as expatriates in the country where they got their education. Mortality rate um, from one to five year olds, 14% again, compared to 24% during the war. And that war, catastrophic civil war from 91 to 2002, followed in 2014 to 16 by the Ebola epidemic. So it's a challenging development environment. Let's look first at the YMCA. YMCA's focus is on youth empowerment, which, and they um, categorize youth as 16 to 35. And 35 might sound um, not so young to some of you, um, but during the Civil War, there was a, it took a devastating toll on human capital in the country. Professional people, community leaders, teachers were coerced into one side or the other of the war. When Jeannie and I went back in 2004 for the first time after our Peace Corps experience, 65% of the country was 18 years of age or less. So there's just this huge decimation of really professional people in the country. Children were abducted, um, fed drugs, trained to be emotionless killers. Um, they, a whole generation of education was lost. Uh, the Y realized that it needed to reverse this situation and help people see their own potential and their responsibility for creating change. Now the guy over here on the left is Christian Kamara. He's the um, general secretary of the Sierra Leone YMCA, uh, YMCA of Sierra Leone. Uh, really bright guy. Um, you'll hear more from him later. He's showing, or he's holding a Missoula YMCA soccer shirt for those of you who may have played in those shirts or know uh, coach kids to play in them. Uh, back in 2009, we formalized a partnership between the YMCA of Sierra Leone and our own Y here in Missoula. We've done some really neat things um, over the past couple years. But more importantly, this picture was taken back in 2013. These kids don't have the internet. They don't have cell phones. They don't have a Toys R Us. So you make your own toys. You get a couple sticks, you find a wheel, you get some twine, and you create a little pota pota, and you wheel that up and down the, the um, center of the town as fast as you can go, hoping you can bump somebody out. Then somebody else gets to take a turn, you do the same thing. I mean, and that's the kind of creativity and initiative that the Y hopes to unleash with their programs. Picture on the process is simple. You get a group of young people together and get them talking about what change do you think is needed? You help them work through the problems and strategies to how they can accomplish that change. What are the next steps? Who needs to be involved? How do you hold um, elected officials accountable? The group on the right had just finished a project with a cohort of young people from the UK putting in a community well and a school latrine in a rural village about 40 miles from where they are in McKinney, which is the capital of the northern province. The computer lab on the left um, came from a project where the Y had identified young people who were interested in starting their own businesses. And they got them together with NGOs and business people as mentors and also financial to financially subsidize some of the projects that they're working on. This computer lab uh, is actually a shipping container, which they renovated and hooked up the electricity to it. So the young people can get together and look at their own project. And as it's stretched here, it's a little skinnier than it used to be. There was a little more room in there. But they can talk about their own projects and what their progress is and what problems they're having um, and also um, manipulate the projects in the, through the computer database. Another really good example of the way the Y process works and how it works, this is uh, called Crew Bay Slum. And Slum was 
their word for the, um, the area. Freetown, which is the capital city of Sierra Leone, is surrounded by mountains. And so when the torrential rains come during the rainy season, waters flood down the hills and go through the uh, open sewage canals and end up down right by the beach, right by the ocean. Freetown is right on the Atlantic Ocean. And so all of this junk comes down and lands right in the area and over on the left there is where the actual town was. Well, the city council had decided that they were going to um, re relocate, not relocate, actually just uh, evict all 10,000 people in the town because some foreign investors came and said, we can put up a high-rise, uh, high-end beachfront resort and you can make a lot of money on that. And who knows how much the money the they offered each of the individual council members. Anyway, these young people got the community together, they protested that um, plan, and got the city council to call it off. One of the young people that was involved was so energized by that process that in the next election he ran for city council and he won. So the, the key to the wise success, again, is convincing people to believe in themselves and their ability to change their life's trajectory. And it comes from within, from within. This is the essence of empowerment. We'll move on to right sharing of world resources. Right sharing is a Quaker organization that provides microfinance grants to women's groups called self-help groups. You'll see the SHG in the slides. Um, in India, in Kenya, and Sierra Leone. In Sierra Leone, they give 10, 10 to 12 grants a year for about $60,000. They contract with the YMCA, and this is Salian Sanko, who is the Y person who runs the programs for right sharing in the country. Well, is this still Sierra Leone? Yes. All these projects are Sierra Leone. Let's see, there we go. Um, if a community is interested in forming a group and starting small businesses, either as individuals or collectively, say in an agricultural project, uh, a rice farm or a groundnut farm or a fisheries project, um, Saliano will go out and help them um, come up with the plan get registered as a community NGO, and open a bank account. What we've learned over the years is if we send the money to an individual, somebody that we don't know a lot about, who may have written the proposal for these women, half the money can be siphoned off and go into that person's pocket. So if it goes into the bank account, you've got signatories who are part of the leadership of this uh, elected leadership of this self-help group. If they're funded, Salion organizes a training on self-governance, on business practices, basic accounting, and maybe most importantly, at that training, which will take three or four days, the paramount chief, the section chiefs, all the uh, traditional leaders in the community are invited, elected leaders from the district are invited, because what we want to do is make sure that these women are recognized for the initiatives they've taken, what they've done to put together this project grant and then ended up getting funded. And that begins to change the mindset of the people about the women's role in that community. Salian also then visits the groups a couple times a year to help with problem solving and also to make sure that each of the women is contributing to the monthly savings plan. That's part of the grant project. They have to have a savings plan. Is that for the, comp the entrepreneur, whatever they set up as a business? So let me give you an example. Um, typical grant is about $5,000. Each woman will end up, there could be 20, could be 40 women in the group. Each woman ends up with about $250 of capital to start off with. Now, over and above that, they have to contribute what turns out to be in United States dollars, less than a dollar 
a month that they're contributing. But the idea that they have a savings account and they have their own money and nobody can touch it but them begins to build the self-confidence that, wow, we can change our situation here. Things can improve for us. It's a major step in building self-esteem for women that have very little control over the other aspects of their life. Does this money also go for like a community pool too, so they don't to the community? Or Good question. So, <laughs> the, so right sharing gives a grant to the organization. The, grant, the organization then with its elected leadership turns around and gives the money out as loans to the individual women. Those women pay back the loan with interest to the group. And at the end of the year, that group has the collected money of the repayment of the principal and that interest. So if it's $5,000 and a typical um, interest rate is 20%, part of which is set that high simply because of inflation, is so unpredictable. Uh, so they can end up with $6,000 at the end of the year, which they can either loan out to other women to join the group, to join the project, recapitalize projects for the women that participated in the first time, or if they find there's another priority community need, and in this case, uh, they decided that they, or they selected this young woman to be the first woman from their village who'd ever gone to university. And they just decided that that was really important. So they took $1,000 to get her into the university. Again, most importantly, the, the self-help group controls the money. Women are required to have that individual savings plan. And they, then they report um, back to right sharing on are people repaying their loans, how do the businesses go, what's happening. Where does, where does the money come from for the um, microloans? Um, how big a pot is it? We, um, right sharing gives out about $200,000 a year between India, Sierra Leone, and um, um, Kenya. About, um, that's 200000 about 100000 of it goes to administration of the program in the countries. When Salian, I mean, Salian, she can't do more than 12 projects in a year. That's why we ended up going down to that because it takes so much time to get back and forth to these really remote villages. Um, so she's on the road an awful lot. And petrol costs, petrol is high, and so the expenses just go up. So we pay her, I think the last I remember, is we were paying her $6,000 a year, which is a good salary over there. But if you think we're putting 100,000 in the three countries, um, 6,000 goes to that, a couple thousand goes to the YMCA for the services they provide, either in management or computer services, things like that. Uh, the vehicles that we use, uh, which are theirs. Um, but probably, you know, so if you go to a school, 80% of the costs of a school are in the teacher's salaries. Over here, it's about 20% that's actually in the salaries for the people and the rest is taken up just in in the cost of doing business in that country. So back to the um, accompaniment. The women only see people from a local organization unless we happen to go over and visit once in a while. So they see the YMCA as the people who are really organizing and helping them make a success of this program. The face of the program is a Sierra Leone woman. And that's a incredibly powerful role model for all of those women. Uh, the women design their own projects. Right sharing simply supports it by providing the money. Um, the grant money is controlled by the women. And $5,000 coming into a rural Sierra Leone village is a lot of money. And that raises the profile of those women significantly. So, and then they're controlling the money and that begins to build the self-confidence of the women and also changes the mindset of the men. Toby. Yeah. Is there anybody who continually assists the women, teaching them maybe you know, how to keep a bank account? Or, you know? That's, it's part of the training that's conducted in the beginning. Salian goes out and 
um, we'll sit down with them. So when I went out, for example, um, the women showed us the minutes of their monthly meeting, so, which can even be a problem. Some of these um, places, you just don't have people that have the literacy skills to take minutes. So in case, well, let's see if I me go back here once. Uh, this woman, uh, Safi, is a teacher in Cambia District. Now she's helped to get three projects started and she'll come out and she'll work with those women to make sure that they keep their records because Salian will only be out there twice during the year. Okay, so we try to provide some of that support. We, we continue to increase the amount of time. So we, we're hiring a new person to assist Salian this year, so she'll have more time for that. Another question, because I was, did the study of a, a women's organization such as this in, when I was living in Tanzania, and a number of the women, the husbands took over their projects. They weren't really in control. Mm -hmm. and, um, so when I was out there, the interesting thing was that some men would come to the meetings. They didn't say anything. They were just interested. Um, well, let me go on to the next, and I'll explain it this way. Um, this is the chief, um, town chief of Binti, one of the towns where um, one of the projects was. And she said that, I love the way, it was much better when she said it than you read it, but, Women are not afraid to work in the fields all day, but they also do the cooking, the washing, they get the kids off to school, and then the men don't let them get any rest at night. The loan program changes the way the women see themselves, and it also begins to change the mindset of her husband. Because all of a sudden, she's seen as a real asset to the family. Now, Christian Kamara said it a little differently takes time and experience to change a mindset. If a husband can see that his wife, having work and a separate income, can make life better for his family, he's not threatened by the perceived loss of prestige, either in the community or in his family. So it's, it's dual. You're not only are you trying to empower the women, but you're gradually changing the mindset of the men that, oh, it's okay if my wife does something besides just provide children for the farm. Okay. Um, this, though, is textbook women's empowerment. Poor, mostly illiterate women living in isolated rural villages can for the first time see the possibility that things can be different for themselves, a co-equal place with the men in the community, and the men begin to accept that change also. And if you look through microfinance literature, you're gonna see this happening in a lot of places. But they had to figure out how to keep the money away from the men. That's why we have a separate bank account. That's why the money is controlled by that self-help group. That's why the women's savings plan goes into the bank account. You gotta keep it away. And in Sierra Leone, there's, if I'm, if I'm Peter's cousin, and he comes back from Freetown with a new Walkman. Peter, I'd like that. And he has to give it to me if I'm in that village. If we're family, you're supporting that family all the time. And so you have to create artificial barriers to keep that money away from other people. Okay, um, Village Hope. In 2013, I joined the board of Village Hope. And what they were in the process of doing, John Bart, who was pictured here, had worked with the Sierra Leone Agricultural Research, in Research Institute for about three years to see how to commercially grow cassava and sell it for a profit. Commercial versus subsistence. Cassava is second only to rice as a staple crop in West Africa. So um, again, we're, so we're turning from strict microfinance type uh, youth empowerment to uh, a business empowerment. And I want to digress here for just a second because in my opinion, economic initiatives and projects are the main drivers of development anywhere in the world. When people have jobs, they can purchase healthcare for themselves. 
When they purchase health care, you provide salaries for the doctors and the nurses. You encourage more people to get into health care because they're going to have a livelihood out of it. When they can send their kids to school, that pays the teachers' salaries. And the teachers, then it encourages more people to get involved in education. Even more than that, maybe, um, the government, if it doesn't have to fund all of these projects with its limited resources, can concentrate on public health, sanitation, um, road transportation system, things like that. And then the most important is simply, if I have a job and I know I can support my family, that's empowering in and of itself. I have, I'm beginning to develop a self-esteem that I didn't have before. So the um, project that we developed was a 500-acre farm of cassava over here. Um, that's midway through the planting season. Uh, a processing plant with equipment to uh, husk the... Cassava is a tuber-type um, plant, vegetable that grows in the ground. You have to peel off the bark, um, and then you grate it, press it, roast it, and you turn it into this gari. Gari, which uh, is a lot of people refer to it as the student's best friend, because you can put a little hot water with that in the morning, and you get a porridge, and it fills your stomach, and it keeps you going until your main meal in the evening. And it's cheap. Okay. Um, so the pro forma for this plan said that we could um, generate enough profits to replicate this project over a number of years in different parts of the country and still have money to give back to the community for development projects, whatever they thought might be important. Maybe a solar array for the local school, maybe paying teacher salaries, maybe a road, whatever they wanted. So the, but the problem is when you're working in a less developed country, you can expect problems, and we had lots of them. We began the farm, and the, um, just as Ebola was crossing the border, it's kind of a nice story on the health side, uh, Lanson Sese, who you'll see here in a minute, before the f people went out to uh, cultivate the land, he had a chlorine solution there and had them all wash their hands. They went out to the field, they worked all day. When they came back, they washed their hands again. And that kind of training imprinted on them, and there were no Ebola cases in this chiefdom of about 2,500 people. And we like to think that part of it was they just learned that it could be avoided, what you had to do. Um, we lost our first 130-acre farm to a wildfire a couple months before it was uh, to be harvested. We bought equipment, this, this particular um, peeler here, and roasters over there uh, from Nigeria because Nigeria is the biggest cassava producer in West Africa. We figured, well, they would have the right kind of equipment. Turned out it didn't work for us. The peeler couldn't handle the tubers, the husk of the tubers that we had, and the equipment that we bought secondhand, the roasting, um, was not manufactured properly, and we were stuck with it. Uh, the biggest problem always when you're in a startup mode with a business is cash flow. We had a grant for about $220,000 from Rotary International out of the Boise Rotary. Um, we raised about $230,000 in private investors, uh, loans, uh, and it still wasn't enough. We still need about $200,000 to really take us over the edge and into the profit. Um, so, we thought we had all the bases covered. Um, we thought we had received buy-in from the chiefdom. Uh, the project was designed in collaboration with Lansa Sase over here on the right, uh, who was involved in everything from leasing the land in the chiefdom to going out to numerous community meetings trying to explain to people what the project was all about, how it would be beneficial for them. Chiefdom elders were consulted in hiring all of the principal people that were involved in the program. 
Dr. Bart lived in Missouri for the first 18, 24 months of the project. Um, on the side, we developed a computer literacy program with donated laptops from the Boise Rotary. And we also created five acre, what we called innovation farms across the chiefdom in different villages to try and get people used to um, modern agricultural methods, using a tractor for cultivation, um, putting fertilizer in the ground. Key is increasing the yield of your product. So um, typical cassava farm will get maybe um, 10 metric tons to the hectare. Hectare is about two and a half acres. Um, 10 metric tons of cassava. If you apply fertilizer, you're going to get 30 to 40 tons. So it's a three to four percent or three, four time increase, which then gives you the profit when you sell it at the end. Um, but it turned out that this wasn't quite enough. If we look at the empowerment side, change takes time. And I, these were put together after talking to the principals in the project for a long time, a lot of time over the last couple of years. But change takes time. We told people that the project would be good for them instead of asking them what they thought the value of the project was for the community. There is a colonial legacy in West Africa. Um, white man, the, the colonist, had all the money, had all the ideas. You just worked for the man. Um, there was, there's a definite lack of um, entrepreneurial experience. A lot of very educated, smart people, but they haven't been put in business situations. They haven't been able to start their own business because capital is not available. Um, so they just don't have that kind of entrepreneurial experience you need to run an agricultural business. Um, if I were to, to sum it up differently, I'd say we've been walking mostly alone instead of walking with the community. We've been pushing from the outside rather than empowering the community to succeed. We believe the idea, the plan we had on paper, could be just superimposed on this chiefdom and everything would work out. I mean, what we were talking about was hiring about 80 full-time positions at about $6 a day, which is average of $6 a day, not including the managers, which is about two and a half times the salary they'd get anywhere else um, in the farming business. Uh, and we would have impacted about 45% of the families in the chiefdom by increasing their income. Um, but as of now, the progress or the prognosis is uncertain. I presented the three examples of development activity, each of which uses empowerment as a part of its design. To summarize the importance of the empowerment project, I'll turn again to Christian Kamara, who said, development being a journey, you have a vision or a goal. And you try to make progress along the way, which sustains your passion and your enthusiasm. You must understand and accept that it takes time and experience to change a mindset. Farmers in Sierra Leone have been doing this, things the same way for generations. It's hard for them to envision how radically changing the way they farm will be of a benefit to them. They'll find many excuses for not changing. But if you can help them recognize the value in changing their practice, to present what looks like a risk as an opportunity, they will come along. And if they come along, you will be accompanying them. Thank you. <laughs> questions? Other questions? Yes? Um, how do you think you reconcile this concept of empowering or accompaniment? with the donor kind of desire for evaluation and outcomes? Let me, let me, uh, well, um, first of all, if you go back to ride sharing. So we, we have to raise five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000 a year. Um, and there's a story to tell because you have poor women and the, the stories are, I mean, you know, you maybe get one meal a day, you can't send the kids to school. So it's relatively easy 
to say, if we can give them the opportunity to make another, if they make another dollar a day or two dollars a day, they've doubled the family income. And that's compelling, that people like to donate to that. Um, we have recognized, we have said that we need to get better at um, monitoring and then evaluating the impact. Problem is, true evaluations cost a lot of money. So, but we've got some plans going where we can do that um, by partnering with other organizations uh, who have some monitoring and evaluative tools in place already. Um, if we just provide laptops or uh, tablets with progress out of poverty index uh, interview questions and we get to interview those same people over three or four years, we'll be able to see whether the impact is there. We've got anecdotal experience, but we don't have hard data yet. What kind of projects were the women doing for this very mycelium? Um, it goes anywhere from um, they might uh, buy palm oil locally and then take it to a roadside uh, stand where you have lorry traffic coming through and sell it in the five gallon containers. Um, in some cases they do uh, collective projects like a, a groundnut farm or a um, rice farm. Um, they've, there's one place where they started with, uh, it was just a, a fisheries project. They were going to go to the wholesalers, buy the fish, bring it back to the villages, sell it in the villages. Then the second year they came back and said, you know, we could go catch the fish and bypass that wholesaler and we'd make more money. And so we gave them money to do that second time around. And how did they come up with the projects? It's like if you don't have an entrepreneurial spirit to start with or experience. Uh, you, it, it's amazing how word of mouth gets around. I mean, almost 8 million people in the community, but um, over the last five years, particularly when you've had somebody visible like Salian Sanko from the Y out in these communities and encouraging people to um, have her come out or come to see her, to help them figure out what they might do. Um, we get, in Sierra Leone, we get probably 20 proposals and we're able to fund 12 in a year. That's 20 proposals that we think might be worth funding. We'll get more proposals that aren't put together. So if, if it's not a good proposal the first time around, doesn't look like it makes business sense, then we'll say, well, think about it and come back and apply next year. Um, I, I did tell a background story when you were talking about the money. I worked in the military for several years and we had a, like a huge warehouse full of all this stuff and all these humanitarian projects that were just so, I mean the bureaucracy will stifle you. Anyways, I had to clean that out as the officer in charge of these people that were cleaning out. I threw away about two million dollars worth of brand new medical equipment because these things didn't take off. It just makes me angry because it's our track of tax paying dollars. But anyway, so when I see these, it's just so, it's so frustrating because, you know, we could have done something with that. But now I'm a stay-at-home mom of a seven-month-old, so I'm more curious about, like, what can I do? I mean, I can't, obviously can't travel, but I want to be a part of this, and I definitely want to be, like, part of the empowerment. But what can we do here? What can I do here? to make an impact there, other than give money, because I'm a stay-at-home mom. So I don't know any of that either. Um, you know, one of the things that you might look at is um, an organization like Soft Landing, where you could get involved locally, where refugees are struggling with, well, how can I make an impact? How can I um, get along in this new country, in this new world that I'm going to live in? Soft and, Landing? Yeah. And by, so it may be by teaching English. Um, it may be mentoring the kids in school to make sure that they're keeping up with the school. Um, and, you know, the sense of that child coming from a different culture and a different language and being able to succeed in school, that's empowering. And for the mom and dad to feel like they're in control and they can move ahead, they've got jobs, but, you know, how am I going to take care of the kids and make sure they're okay? helping to provide services like that, you're in, in, it's the perfect company moment. You're walking with them in their own journey. Awesome. Thank you. Chris, I think that, that was a great suggestion. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we also have Haley right here who could say a few things about Missoula Medical Aid, which is another 
possibility along these lines? Yeah, um, they, as far as, they have various local activities that, that you can support, um, a salsa ball every year. Um, but uh, that's more healthcare professionals that travel down there with them. Um, uh, but they're a great local organization to support and just whenever you see it. They're trying to get out into the community and have more, like, um, they just had a uh, Moscow Mule Bay at Montgomery Distillery. <laughs> Sometimes you can support these places by going out and having a drink. I want to go back to medical aid because we had a speaker, um, oh, it was um, two weeks ago, Brianna um, Barger Camate. Um, she's a physician in an emergency room physician in Spokane. She's married to a Malian, um, they, and they've started an organization over there. Um, provide, actually basically raise money here to provide services, uh, for services for people who can't afford it in Mali. And they have a network of people, um, physicians in Mali who make sure that the money is well spent. But um, what she said was a lot of the medical aid uh, missions will go in and they'll do a hundred cataracts in a week or something like that. And she said there's a risk that there's an ophthalmologist right there in that country. And you may be taking away some of the people who could pay for that service. So you gotta watch out. Well, um, Missoula Medical Aid has worked with um, ch Save, the children. Save the Children for a long time. And so that's their, uh, that's their feet on the ground in that country. So it's similar to um, when right sharing makes a grant to these people the group controls the money and they give out the loans to the individuals, their neighbors and friends in that community. If, if I go back and look really at what, um, where Village Hope um, was less successful, we needed to be in that chiefdom, in that community for a year talking to people and just telling, well, you know, so have you thought about this or what if we could do this? and really get them to buy in and invest it in the project. The fact that the women are coming together and creating their own project puts that investment right away. The fact that they're controlling the money builds that self-esteem tremendously. So you wanna make sure that you're, wherever the money goes, there's an organization on the ground that's uh, of people from that country. That's the important thing. Dean? Yeah. Chris, do the women involved in the self-help projects uh, not only have the traditional expectations of the men to contend with, but maybe some cultural resistance uh, from other women? Um, I, it, it's possible because what you're doing is kind of creating an exclusive group. Some group of women in the community have decided they're going to do this. But the expectation all along is that if they're successful, then they'll be able to add women to the project next year and make loans to them. So there is um, the potential to bring in those other women. But I'm sure there's, you know, how, do, how do we get together as a group? Well, I know you're my friend, so you can be in the group with me. And I don't like that person, so I'm not going to have them in the group. I'm sure that happens a little bit. Um. <clears throat> Probably you and most of the people know about Kiba, K-I-B-A, mm -hmm. and that seems um, to me like something that, you know, is that idea of entrepreneur, the money going directly on a small scale each time. The $25 makes a big difference and comes back. I just wondered what you know, if that is that effective, and also, there's another one that I get so much literature from that I do not give to, is um, FINCA. FINCA. That's a big yeah, organization, I yeah. Much, but I'm just curious what you know about those two. I don't know a whole lot about either of them, but I have opinions, of course. <laughs> um, number one, with Kiva, where it's primarily livestock they're giving out. So that's, that's an asset, not, not Kiva, um, but then there's another one. Um, the, yeah, Heifer. Um, 
So if you're starting with an asset, like a cow or like a goat, uh, then you've got the chance to multiply that herd. Um, but it is an asset that's controlled by the family. I like that idea. Um, I remember distinctly being in Sierra Leone back in 2013 and meeting a couple of young college students who were supposed to be um, evaluating Heifer International's programs over there, and they didn't have a clue how to do it and they wouldn't have known black from white in the community. So they haven't figured out the, um, how to measure the impact yet. They're gonna get there. I mean, again, I don't think, you're, you're not talking about giving them a lot of money and there's high probability that it's gonna help somebody. Right sharing was in that situation for a long time. We just figured the more money we can get out there to these women, they don't have enough money to feed their families, put their kids in school, we'll at least be doing some good that way. We've matured somewhat from that to where, okay, what we want is a business where this collateral can revolve to other people in the community and benefit more people over time. Do you know about free trade? Well, uh, there, there, there isn't any in Sierra Leone. Uh, there may be some in Kenya. Now, John Bart, uh, my partner on the Village Hope Project, has gotten into trading because he's been able to establish contacts with um, um, uh, chocolate uh, companies, uh, coffee companies uh, in Europe and in the United States. And um, so what he's doing is putting together farmers with the idea that, okay, we get those farmers to use better farming methods. We've got an export product for them. We can provide the market for them. It helps balance the trade in the country uh, and provides extra money for um, these local farmers. Chris, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking quite a bit about your last couple of slides where you talk about the Casaba project and how it's uncertain how it's going to end up and how it takes a long time for change to occur. Have you thought about using, I think this really would fit nicely with your empowerment approach, have you thought about using the technique of positive deviance as an approach to bringing about change? Do you know how hard it would be to interpret positive deviance in Timney? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, you don't have to interpret the word. <laughs> Basically, what you want to find is, you want to find someone who would stand out because they would essentially do the kind of things that would lead to that change. And then that person would become a role model for other people in the village. That was the idea of the innovation farms. We basically had a contract with one master farmer. Um, figuring that he was going to be the early adapter. Um, again, we needed to do that for two, three years to make it work, and we ran out of money to do that kind of a thing. Um, the, other, the, the other thing that has developed, and it's because, to a certain extent, because in Sierra Leone they have some experience with it, I think a lot of countries, uh, World Bank got into cooperatives, and they really wanted things to happen through cooperatives. Well, um, what has developed in our Missouri town is three cooperatives in the area and um, those people leased our tractor to go out and plow fields um, and the money goes back to the cooperative rather than to the individual and so they're beginning to see a value in what Village Hope provides because they have no other way to modernize their farming. So there is a little bit of that transition going on. But to specifically say, again, uh, what we need is a good Peace Corps volunteer who's been there a couple years who can identify those people who would be the positive deviants that you're looking for. Shannon. I just want to ask about um, how the women are spending their money, and if you have any examples. The, um, I would ask in each of the, the I, so in last year when I went back, I went to three different projects and I would ask one or two of the women. And invariably they said, now I can feed my family and I can send my kids to school. Those are the very first things on their minds. Um, in one 
place, again, it was obvious that the women had gotten together to talk about what they were going to do with the money because what they wanted next, they wanted a little bit more so that they could build a storage building for the rice that they had harvested so they could keep it, not have to sell it right away. Um, but it's those immediate needs, um, being able to feed the family and send the kids to school. They, they have an incredible appreciation for education if it's available to them. Do they send their boys anger, like little girls are going to school in all these areas? Um, it, it breaks off when you get to secondary school and then fewer of the girls are sent to secondary school. If the family has enough money for one, it's going to be the boy that goes. Now, there's, there's another Peace Corps volunteer, um, former Peace Corps volunteer, who has started a um, girls' school in the town where she used to be a Peace Corps volunteer. And it's, it's blossomed into a really great uh, situation. It's all girls' secondary school. There's another Peace Corps volunteer, um, former volunteer out in Seattle, who is in the process of building her 26th elementary school. And part of the, when they go to funders, try and find the money, they say, we've got to have teacher salaries for these teachers, too. And now they have the latrines, and now they have the um, girls' sanitation product, project, products that, and the education that goes with it. Oh, if you're looking for something to do at home, I could plug Days for Girls. I think Sarah Webb is a member of the mm -hmm. board as well, but they work on menstrual hygiene management, which is a huge barrier for girls getting to secondary school in a lot of places. And you can actually start a sewing circle at home. They have like the ability to donate physical materials, which they that then get sold. They also start micro businesses in other countries and stuff. But oh, is that the one that some lady came and talked to last? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's, there's that for something that you can actually physically do at home that's maybe not a huge investment of money, but um, a potential to contribute to their work in a real way. I do own a sewing machine. It's probably in storage. <laughs> <laughs> Talk is posted on our website. It was the first one of um, last year, so um, she was a really good speaker and very inspirational. Sarah Webb with Days for Girls. If you want to learn more about that organization, she's no longer with them, but they're still an organization that does really good work. And their, their products are really well received in the field, I can say from experience. So they're a good, awesome. good organization. Thank you. Well, um, thanks. This has been uh, very informative and inspirational. Uh, before I, th I officially thank you for this talk, I want to let you know what's coming up next week. Uh, next week, Deborah Goldman, um, who is a global health nurse, midwife, and consultant, is going to be talking about addressing high maternal mortality and the right to safe, respectful maternity care. Uh, so that's one that you probably don't catch next I'd like year. to add, she was also a Peace Corps volunteer in Tanzania. Oh, all right. So thanks, the Gail. Peace Corps people are interested. She's yeah. coming from Seattle. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Gail, for letting us know that. Thank you for helping to bring her here. Um, so, I, you know, I just want to say a few things about uh, the Peace Corps, actually, and, and <coughs> in connection with Chris's talk tonight. You know, some of you probably read that the University of Montana is is once again in the top 10 uh, in the country, middle-sized schools in, our, in terms of our placement of people in the Peace Corps. Uh, and this is something that I, I personally take a lot of pride in and really feel like the University of Montana is, is a wonderful institution for that. And I think, you know, you can see the impact of the Peace Corps long term. I mean, Chris and Jeannie started out, what did you say it was, 1967? in the Peace Corps? How many years ago? I was 10. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like, that's like 50 years ago now. And he's still doing that same kind of stuff right now. I mean, that is really impressive. And I, I think you know, a lot of you here are from uh, return Peace Corps volunteers. I know you're all doing similar kinds of things. Uh, and so we all have a great deal of gratitude for you. And you know, a lot of times people come to me and say, what good is Peace Corps? And my answer, and you know, this is again an opinion, not based on empirical results, my answer basically is the Peace Corps helps 
in a small way in terms of the ways in which people, volunteers serve during their Peace Corps experience. But what the Peace Corps really changes are the volunteers themselves. Uh, and you know, I think we've seen that here tonight, and I want to thank you, Chris, from the bottom of my heart for all you continue to do uh, and, and your great commitment uh, that grew out of your Peace Corps experience and you continue to do today. So please join me in, in thanking Chris Siegel. Walk out the back.